Amen, amen. If you got your Bibles, turn with me to Genesis chapter 32. I want to begin reading verse 24. Amen, amen. We're glad to have Josh and Sydney with us this morning. Amen. And all of our visitors. But I put them to work. I appreciate him uh, filling in and helping me out this morning. Amen. Amen. So give, give them a hand. Give him a hand. If you... Amen, amen. We appreciate, appreciate that so much. Amen. It's been a big help to me this morning. Amen. Genesis chapter 32, beginning at verse 24. It says, Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, Let me go, for the day breaks. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, What is your name? He said, Jacob. And he said, Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked, saying, Tell me your name, I pray. And he said, Why is it that you ask about my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. I want to preach this morning with the Lord's help on getting desperation, desperation back in the church. Getting desperation back in the church. Pray with me and for me today, if you would. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you for your spirit that we feel here today. God, we thank you, God, for what you're doing in our church. God, we're seeing so many good things, and we're so thankful for that. God, and I, I just thank you, God, for the opportunity, Lord, to stand here behind this pulpit. God, I don't feel worthy, but Lord, I just come as a willing vessel. God, for you to use, and Lord, that's all that you're ever looking for, is just a willing vessel. God, I offer myself to you today. God, I pray you would anoint this word that you've laid upon our heart to share with this people. God, I pray that you would just let it build up and encourage and strengthen those here today. God, and we'll just give you the praise and the honor and the glory. And the church said, amen, amen. Getting desperation back in the church. Thank you. This is a very interesting passage at a pivotal point in Jacob's life. Jacob had been wrestling with his identity all of his life. Can anybody relate to that? Jacob wrestled with his identity all of his life. And even at birth he wrestled with Esau, the Bible says, and caught the heel of his foot as they were being born. Jacob wanted to be blessed. But the Bible tells us that his father Isaac loved Esau and wanted to bless him more than he wanted to bless Jacob. Can I just stop there and say there are people here today who knows what it is like to long for the blessing of their father. Let me say that again. There are people here today who knows what it is like to long for the blessing of their father. And one of the meanings of Jacob's name is deceiver. That is the term his brother Esau definitely placed on him. And I'm sure Jacob had to hear those words most of his life. Deceiver, deceiver. You are nothing but a deceiver. But Jacob wanted to be blessed. Even though there were a couple incidents where he did live up to his name, he wanted to be blessed. And the first time that he lived up to his name as, as this deceiver was when he deceived his brother Esau into selling his birthright for a cup of stew. Because he was famous from all the hunting that he had done and Esau declared, what good is my birthright to me 
now. Look, I'm about to die. But Jacob made him swear an oath to sell his birthright to him. The second time was when, was when he deceived his own father, Isaac, into thinking that, uh, that he was Esau and he stole Esau's blessing. Afterwards, he had to run for his safety and went and dwelt with his uncle Laban. There he would ask for Rachel to be his wife. He would work seven years only to be deceived into marrying Leah. He would then work another seven years for Rachel. Later, he married Leah's maid, Zilpah, and Rachel's maid, Bilhah. In less than 13 years, Jacob fathered 11 sons by four wives. After serving Laban for 14 years, the two men came to a new arrangement. Jacob would continue to shepherd Laban's flock, and his wages would be all the spotted, speckled, and brown animals in the flock. Jacob became wealthy in short order with large flocks, servants, camels, and donkeys. After 20 years in Haran, Jacob returned to Canaan, coming eventually to a place called Penal. Jacob named the place Penal, face of God, because of the encounter that he had there. It was here that Jacob wrestled with God. Has anybody ever had a wrestling match with God? He wrestled with God. Why did he wrestle? Because he wanted to be blessed. Hosea gave us an interesting window into his wrestling match. He added this comment about Jacob while in the struggle. He says, he wept and sought favor from him. Hosea 12 and 4 is where you'll find that. He wept and sought favor from him. Hosea told us something Genesis didn't. Jacob was weeping during this encounter. Now think about that. Let me ask you this question. Did Jacob weep because the pain was so severe or because he wanted God so badly? <laughs> See, I'm going somewhere with this. Did Jacob weep because the pain was so severe or because he wanted God so badly? In the distress of the ordeal, I doubt Jacob could separate it out. I don't know if I'm crying because I'm hurting so intensely or if I'm crying because I want you and your blessing so badly. All I know is I'm in so much pain and I want you so desperately. Let me ask you this. Have you ever been that desperate? Have you ever been that desperate? And if you have, when was the last time that you were that desperate? Desperation is defined as a state of despair, typically one that results in rash or extreme behavior. We see this with Jacob, but I believe that we have lost a lot of that desperation in the church. Let me explain what I mean. The church used to be troubled when there wasn't anyone being saved in the altars. The church used to be troubled and were constantly praying and requesting additional prayer for their lost family and friends. But it seems like now it doesn't trouble the church as much as long as our programs are successful. But I want to challenge you this morning. We need desperation back in the church so that our hearts yearn for the things that God yearns for. That we yearn for lost souls to be saved. That we yearn for people's lives to be changed. So that we yearn for people to be healed and set free and delivered because that's what's on God's heart. Amen. Amen. We need desperation back in the church. Let me ask you this. What would happen? You know, because a lot of times we say, boy, that was a good service. You know, and I'm, and I'm not knocking, knocking, our, you know, the, 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 the good that God's doing. But, but let me just challenge you, this, challenge you with this question. What would happen if we gauged whether we had a good service or not, whether people come to the altars and got saved or, 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 or whether you know some lives were changed that day come on 
Because, can I, see, we have become so comfortable in the church that, that, that it's all about us. Amen. And it's all about, well, you know, we, we and, 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 and again, I'm not knocking, I know that sometimes the church needs to, to be encouraged and, and the church needs strength along the way. We come, or, or should come on Sunday to get built up for the week so that we can go out there and come on somebody. But we have we have uh, have gotten so comfortable that 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 it, Sister Kay that we 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 come to church and we say oh I wonder what pastor is going to preach today that's going to lift me up that's going because it's all about me and we gauge our services on that and we think well it was a good service because pastor preached a good sermon that I could relate to <laughs> Amen and, and and again I'm not knocking that we need that but I want to I want to challenge you we need desperation back in the church that it us when somebody's not coming to the altar and getting saved that it bothers us when we know there's somebody that needs to be healed and we we don't get a prayer through come on somebody we need that kind of desperation back in the church amen we need that and you say, how, how are we going to get desperation back in the church I want to give you three ways I believe we can get it back First of all, number one, we get our priorities back in line. We get our priorities back in line. Matthew 6, tells us, but seek first the kingdom of God. <laughs> seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things shall be added to you. What does that mean? That we've got to put first things first. It's so easy to get caught up in the things of this life that we lose our focus on the main reason that we are here. Come on. We lose our focus. In the passage I just read, Jesus is teaching those around him not to worry about the things of this life, what we're going to eat or what we're going to wear. He describes how God feeds the birds of the air and then asks if we are not much more valuable than they are. He goes on to describe how God clothes the grass of the field which is here today and tomorrow is thrown in the fire. He then asks if God will not much more clothe us. He explains that God knows that we have need of these things. What's the point? He's saying don't worry about these things. Worry about the kingdom of God. Oh, hallelujah. He said, we, uh, God knows that we have needed these things, but he encourages us to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be given to us as well. God knows that we, God knows that we need uh, the money to pay our, our rent or pay our house payment or pay our car payment. God knows those things. And he cares about those things. He's going to take care of us when we seek first the kingdom. We've got, we got to, to, to have our heart on the kingdom of God, building the kingdom of God. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 19 uh, through 21, he said, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is... There your heart will be also. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. In other words, what's your heart on? That's where your treasure is. Is it I'm on lost souls or is it, is it about getting what I need all the time? Amen? God cares about those things. He does. And Jesus Jesus made a point in, 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 in explaining that he cares about those things. But seek, seek the main thing. A good example of, of getting his priorities out of line is King Saul. 1 Samuel 15, after Saul disobeyed the Lord by sparing Agag and the best of the sheep and the cattle, the fat cows and the lambs, everything that was good, Samuel said to Saul, although you were once small in your own eyes. Think about that. He's reminding him of where he came from. 
And he's saying, although you were once small in your own eyes, did you not become the head of the tribes of Israel? And he sent you on a mission saying, go and completely destroy those wicked people, the Amalekites. Wage war against them until you have wiped them out. Why did you not obey the Lord? Why did you pounce on the plunder and do evil in the eyes of the Lord? Saul answered, but I did obey the Lord. I went on the mission the Lord assigned me. I completely destroyed the Amalekites and brought back Agag their king. The soldiers took sheep and cattle from the plunder, the best of what was devoted to God, in order to sacrifice them to the Lord your God at Gilgal. How was it that, that Samuel told Saul that he had disobeyed the Lord, but Saul replied back that he had obeyed the Lord? Saul along the way, had gotten his priorities out of line. He obeyed God as much as he wanted to. I said he obeyed God as much as he wanted to. I could preach right there. Because you know what? There's a lot of people in the church, they obey God as much as they want to. Come on. God tells them to do something they don't want to do. I mean, they're, they're going to do and then if anything said about it, well, I am obeying the Lord. Because they're partially obeying the Lord, they're just not completely obeying the Lord. Come on, somebody. Oh, come on. And so he had gotten his priorities out of line. And he obeyed God as much as he wanted to. And when it came down to destroying all the plunder and killing King Agag, he wanted to spare them to show how great of a king he was. In other words, when it came down to it, he was more concerned about how good he looked in front of the people than he did obeying God. Can I tell you, that, 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 that filtrates in the church even today. Oh, come on, somebody. Because somewhere, see, we have forgotten what it was like when we were back there and God was dealing with our heart and we couldn't stand it any longer. Chuck, we didn't care. We had to come to that altar. We didn't care what anybody else thought. Amen. We no longer cared. We had to, to, to have the Lord to come into our heart. We had to, to, to bring it down to the altar. But somewhere along the way, we forget about what it was like. We're just like King Saul, and we forget about what it was like. Amen. When we were small in our own eyes, and somehow we kind of get this because, we, you know, somewhere along the way, God, God starts blessing and, and then maybe opening up some doors and, and starts, you know, doing some things in our life. And people recognize that and they, they commented about that. So now when God gets a hold of our heart and we feel God tugging and we feel like we need to come to the altar to make some things right and we need to, we need to pray about some things and God's tugging our heart, it's a lot harder to come down there then because we're worried about what people think. So we come to the, to the church and we're coming and we're kind of like, okay, we want to do everything that makes us look good. And we're going to pray, lift our hands when they, when they sing their songs. And, and we come and we're, we're broken and we've got some things in our life that we've not dealt with. And we, we, we refuse to come to, come on, I'm preaching better than your amen. Amen, we refuse to come to this altar. Amen, we refuse to, to make things right because we're worried about what people's going to say. Hey. But you see, when we get desperate, when we get desperate enough, uh, amen, we, we, we no longer worry. We, we go back to our roots. Uh, amen, we go back to our first love. The Bible tells us, uh, uh, explain it in one of the churches to, in Revelation. Uh, amen, he said, you've lost your first love. Uh, amen, you need to get it back to your first love. Uh, amen, that's getting your priorities in line and saying, God, I don't care what people think. Uh, amen, I'm going to make uh, sure uh, that I'm right with you. Uh, amen, if that means come to this altar. Amen, and everybody looking at me. I'm going to come to the altar. And I challenge you to do that. I challenge you to do that. Don't be carrying those things around. Because see something, let me go a step further. 
See, sometimes, sometimes we have we have issues and maybe some some things in the church. And I've I've told you about this before, but I but I, but I feel like it needs uh, bears repeating. We 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 come to the church and maybe somebody said something that hurt our feelings or or or, 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 or done something that 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 we didn't like. Come on. We come to church and we don't even want to half look at them. We make sure we're sitting on the opposite side of the church because we don't want to even talk to them. And then we want to come and, you know, Pastor, how how you doing today? I'm doing good. I'm blessed in the Lord. Knowing that you're carrying that junk around. Come on. And we come and we, and, and maybe pastor or preach a, a, a sermon and it, well, Lord knows how to speak to you. He may be preaching something totally different than what you're dealing with right then, but, the, but something will come out of that that God will, come on. And you know God's talking to you. And so here you are with the decision to make. Oh, Lord, I know that I've carried this anger all week. And it's almost turning into bitterness because I don't even want to look at them. Lord, I know you're dealing with my heart right now. I can't stand it. And I know I need to go to the altar and make it right. Oh, but I can't do that. What's people going to think? I, t- I teach on Wednesday night. Or I, I do this or I do that. What are they going to think? And we sit, sit back because we're more worried about what people think than about making things right with God. And you think you're all right and you say, well, I'll just deal with that on my own later. And you don't deal, come on. I wasn't want, I planning on taking this much time right here, but I feel like I'm preaching to somebody. And so, so, we, so we carry, the, and so, so we say, well, I'll, I'll deal with that later. And we don't deal with it, and we keep coming back Sunday after Sunday, and it's still there. And it just keeps building and building. Come on, somebody. God wants you to take care of that. Amen. And you need to get that desperation back in your life that you're not worried about what people think. Amen. And, you know, most of the time you come to the altar, people don't even have to know. If you just come be obedient. But even if they do know, who cares? As long as you make things right with, come on. Amen. Yeah, you're probably right. They're probably going to know anyway. Because you think, you, think, you think you're hiding it pretty good, but people see it on your face when they walk by and you go, mm, how are you doing? Come on. So since King Saul got his priorities out of line, and so he, he, he says, I did obey God. When it came to this, down to destroying all the plunder, And killing Agag, he wanted to spare them to show how great of a king he was. And so Samuel replied, he said, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the evil of idolatry, because you have rejected the word of the Lord. He has rejected you as king. Then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. I violated the Lord's command and your instructions. I was afraid of the men, and so I gave in to them. What's he doing? He said, well, it's their fault. (laughs) Come on. I don't know. None of you have ever done that. Well, I wouldn't have had this attitude. If it it was their fault, they started it. And so, so you know, he he says, you know, I, I gave in to them. And now I beg you to forgive my sin and come back with me so that I may worship the Lord. 
But Samuel said to him, I will not go back with you. You have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you as king over Israel. And as Samuel turned to leave, Saul caught hold of the hem of his robe, and it tore. And Samuel said to him, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to one of your neighbors, to one better than you. He who is the glory of Israel does not lie or change his mind, for he is not a human being that he should change his mind. But notice Saul's response. Even after all of this, God had his, had his number. And Saul replied again, I've sinned, but please honor me before the elders of my people and before Israel come back with me so that I may worship the Lord your God. So Samuel went back with Saul and Saul worshiped the Lord. After all that was spoken to Saul from the Lord, his main concern was still looking good in front of the people. We must become so desperate that we're no longer concerned about what people think or say, but instead become more concerned about obeying God and fulfilling everything that He's called us to do. But the second, second way we can get desperation back in the church is to get rid of pride. Get rid of pride. I'm reminded of the woman with the issue of blood. She spent all that she had, but she continued to get worse. Have you ever felt like that? Have you ever felt like that no matter what you did to try to make things better, it just got worse? <laughs> and when she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if only I may touch his garment, I shall be made well. <laughs> she was so desperate that she did not care what the people would think. She pressed her way through the crowd. And can I just tell you that when we get desperate enough for a move of God, soul saves, lives change. We will not worry about what people think. Instead, we will press our way through to the altars where we can pray until we see something happen. In other words, we ought to be filling our altars every Sunday. Because we ought to be praying, we ought to be desperate, saying, God, we need a revival. God, we need a move of God. God, we need you to, 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 to send lost people here. And we want to see them saved. Immediately, the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. And Jesus immediately, knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, you see the multitude thronging you and you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said, daughter, your faith has made you well. Hallelujah. Your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. I'm reminded of blind Bartimaeus who was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. <laughs> I could just hear them, shut up, shut up. <laughs> Hallelujah. But he cried out to more. And can I just tell you, when we get desperate enough for God, you will not be concerned about what people are saying around you. They may think that you're crazy. But your only focus is on him and on his kingdom. And you just keep crying out that same prayer. God, we need a move of God. God, we need a move of God. God, we need a move of God. And we keep crying out, not worried about what people think around us. Jesus stopped and said, call him. I love that. You know why? Because his desperate cry for help caused Jesus to stop. 
where he was to see what he wanted. Can I just tell you, when we get desperate enough to keep calling on Jesus until he answers, we'll see God move. You know what that's called? A prayer of persistence. Jesus describes that in Luke 11. He says, suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, don't bother me, the door is already locked. And my children and I are in bed, I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. So they called a blind Bartimaeus. They said, cheer up. On your feet. He's calling you. And throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and he came to Jesus. I love that too because, see, he took off the very thing that had, that had identified him as a blind man. The very thing that I identified him as a blind man. He's now casting it aside in faith, believing that he will receive his sight and will never need that cloak again. And see, when we come to Jesus, we must cast aside every weight. Come on. And every sin that so easily ensnares us and run with endurance the race that's set before us. Third way. Let me give you the third one. Third way we can get desperation back in the church is to love God more than anything else. Love God more than anything else. Jesus asked Peter this question. He said, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said, yes, Lord. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. You see, after Peter had denied Jesus three times, Peter needed special attention. And in return, Jesus asked Peter three times if he loved him. Peter needed to understand that if he was going to carry out the mission Jesus had given to him, it would take his devoted love for Christ to carry it out. Can I just tell you the same is true for us? We may have an excitement for the call God has placed on us, but it will take our devoted love for Christ to carry it out through the challenging and difficult times along the way. The Bible tells us about a rich young ruler who came to Jesus and said, What can I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said, You know the commandments. Started giving them to him. He said, Lord, I've, I've kept these all my life. The Bible said, because Jesus loved them, he said, one thing that you lack. <laughs> because Jesus loved them, he challenged him and said, there's one thing that you lack. Go sell all that you have. Give it to the poor. <laughs> and come and follow me. You know what he was telling them? He, he's saying, Lord, I, I've kept all the commandments. You know, I, I, I'm doing pretty good. You know, that, that, that sounds, like a, sounds like a lot of us in the church today. Don't we? I go to church every Sunday. I pay my tithes. I, you know, I, I'm doing good. But Jesus pointed out the one thing 
And this one thing really revealed to him that he hadn't kept even the first commandment. Because if he had loved God with all of his heart, come on, it wouldn't have been nothing for him to give up everything and to come and follow him. But he, was, he went away sad because he had a lot to give up. Can I just tell you, God is still asking the same for us. We need that same desperation. But can I just challenge you and say this again? I believe we've lost a lot of that desperation. Because let me ask you this challenging question. What if God was to tell you to give up everything right now? To go do something for him. Would you be willing to do it? Would you be all right to do it? Because see, when we're desperate enough, nothing else matters. When we love God enough, nothing else matters. But see, a lot of us would be challenged with that. Because we'd be, we would say, well, Lord, what about this? What about that? How am I going to take care of my family? How am I going to do But when we get that desperation back in the church, that's why. That's why that, you know, years ago, Sister Kay, it wasn't nothing. Have two or three weeks worth of revivals, maybe even longer than that. You know why? Because people were desperate. They wanted to see, to, to see a move of God. They wanted us to, to 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 see their lost family saved. They knew that there was still plenty of work that needed to be done. So it wasn't nothing for them to just keep coming every night. But I got to tell you, it's a challenge these days to have a weekend revival. Come on, don't shout me down. I mean, if you was to try to have a week revival, it, I mean, it Why? Because we're so busy with this in this life and, and with our jobs and with you know, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. I'm just saying that, that we need to have our priorities in line that we say, God, I love you more than anything else. God, you're number one, and God, everything that I have is just uh, just because you blessed me with it anyway. So God, whatever you tell me to do, I'm going to do it because I'm going to trust you with my business. I'm going to trust you with my job. I'm going to trust you with, with, with the things that, I, that, that, that I'm concerned about. I'm going to trust you with it. Do you, hear, do you understand what I'm saying? We need that kind of desperation. Sister Elsie, back in the church. Because when we get that desperation back, I believe that's when we'll start seeing God move and start seeing souls saved and start seeing these things that we all desire. When we get desperate enough, we'll be willing to push our plates aside to see souls saved. When we get desperate enough, we'll, we'll be willing to, to give sacrificially to see the kingdom of God spread. I'm talking about desperation. Amen. We need desperation. Back in the church. Amen. Come on to the music, guys. Whoever's going to cover that. Amen. I just appreciate it's been a blessing to me to have, have those who just helped me today. I appreciate them. But let me ask you this. Are you desperate enough to see a move of God where souls are being saved? Lives changed, people delivered, and people healed and set free. Everybody stand to your feet.